Inaugural lectures by newly appointed and promoted professors celebrate the finest of our academic leaders. It's a significant milestone in their academic career, celebrating their promotion to the rank of a professor or their appointment to a chair or other professorship at the university. An inaugural lecture provides an opportunity to present an overview of their career so far, update colleagues on current and future research plans, and introduce their field of expertise to a wider audience. It also gives us a chance to, to recognise achievement, host a celebratory event to bring staff together, to engage with broader audiences inside and outside the university, and to establish new collaborations, strengthen our existing relationships and catch up with the alumni. Ranuka Visvanathan is a graduate of the University of Adelaide, having completed her medical degree in 1996, her PhD in the research area of nutrition, nutritional frailty in 2005, when she, was also she also commenced as the Director of Aged and Extended Care Services at Queen Elizabeth Hospital, in addition to her academic position in the School of Medicine. She is a recognised authority on nutrition in older people and has major research interests in nutrition of frailty, falls prevention including technological advances and postprandial hypotension. She is the Centre Director of the Australian Geriatrics Training and Research Unit with Aged Care, GTRAX, and she was promoted to the Professoriate in January 2014. I'm absolutely delighted to invite her to now present her inaugural lecture. Thank you very much. Okay, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I want to express my sincere thanks to the many who are in the audience today who have made it especially for the day and who are here to share this day. I hope that by the end of this lecture, we will all leave the room with a common goal of achieving healthier aging. And we will do this by attending to our nutritional health. We will also hopefully be better positioned to encourage and motivate others that we know or care for to achieve the same. I will kick start with this disclaimer. I am not a dietitian or a nutritionist and therefore will not be able to provide details on diets or nutrients. Next, I declare the following conflict of interests. Today, I'll start off by answering three common questions that I'm frequently asked about myself. I will then define nutritional frailty and healthy aging. I will also discuss the prevalence of undernutrition and highlight the consequences of undernutrition. I will outline the potential factors contributing to nutritional frailty, followed by screening methods that help us identify risk. We will also talk about some intervention strategies. Throughout the talk, I'll discuss research undertaken at the University of Adelaide and, where possible, indicate how it has or may contribute to change in clinical practice. So I often get asked the following three questions. So we'll start with the first one. Where are you from? Well, I grew up in a town called Alosta, which is the capital city of the state Kedah in Malaysia. Kedah is known as the rice bowl of Malaysia and mainly because of the paddy fields. So I think perhaps I was destined to undertake research in nutrition. When I moved to Alosta, the Sultan of Kedah was the fifth king of Malaysia at the age of 47 years. So for those who are not familiar with Malaysia, they have nine sultans who take turn to be the overall king of the country every five years. Now when I visit Alosta, he is the 14th king of the country he is aged 87 years old. He is the only king to have been king twice in a lifetime. And perhaps his secret to healthy aging is daily golf, a game that I actually enjoy. So the next question I get asked is, why did you choose to move to Adelaide? So since primary school, we were always taught that Captain Francis Light founded Penang in 1786. So when I arrived in Adelaide, I was fascinated to learn that the first um, surveyor general for Adelaide was Colonel William Light. Surely there must have been a relationship between the two. Well, in preparing for this lecture today, I found out that Vil William Light was born in Kuala Kada. So basically, Kuala Kada is the port of Alosta where you catch the ferry to go to Langkawi. So 
The first migrant to Adelaide was from my town in 1836. The next question I get asked is, why did you choose Adelaide University? Well, the University of Adelaide was a, family inst uh, was a familiar institution to my family. They were aware that it had a very good reputation. In fact, our family GPs, a husband and wife couple, were graduates of the University of Adelaide. They met and fell in love at the medical school at the University of Adelaide. My uncle then migrated in the 70s, so it's no surprise that my parents then encouraged my brother to attend the medical school at the University of Adelaide in 1984. So it then follows that I arrived here to study medicine in 1991. It is quite clear that I haven't left the university as yet. However, if there are any of my university classmates here, they will remember my farewell party that, that was held at the planet in 1996. So like many other developed nations around the world, uh, the Australian population is aging. Over the next 40 years, there will be a dramatic increase in the number of people aged 65 years and older. The greatest increase will be seen in those aged 80 years and older. It is said that Howard Florey's invention of penicillin has contributed significantly to longevity. Howard Florey was a Nobel Prize winner and a 1921 graduate of the medical school at the University of Adelaide. Until the end of World War II in 1945, the average life expectancy of humankind remained largely unchanged and was only 50 years. By the early 1960s, Flory was quoted as saying, I'm now accused of being partly responsible for the population explosion, one of the most devastating things that the world has got to face for the rest of the century, perhaps a little bit negative. So older people are in fact positive contributors to society. Healthy aging is a term that is used interchangeably with other terms such as active aging. Active aging is the process of optimizing opportunities for health, participation and security in order to enhance quality of life as people age, allowing older people to realize their potential for physical, social and mental well-being throughout the life course. There are many older citizens across the world who demonstrate healthy aging and continue to contribute through leadership, entertainment, business, and philanthropy. Many older people are advisors, educators, volunteers, carers, and grandparents. Frailty is a major threat to the independence of older people. Frailty is the collected culmination of a lifetime of assaults on the body by lifestyle, social, or medical problems. It results in reduced resilience. The frail individual is weak, slow, and vulnerable to stressor events such as acute illnesses. Here we see a timeline of someone who might live from 0 to 80 years. And over the lifetime, there is impact from socioeconomic status. There's also lifestyle choices that might impact on the future life course. There's accumulation of risk factors for chronic diseases, then the advent of some diseases, and over time increasing frailty and diseases seen with frailty. Here we see Ali, a figure that we all recognize. Very recently in the newspaper, it was quoted that Ali is frail. Here we can see images of Ali over time becoming increasingly slower, weak, and frail. So how common is frailty? There has been very little research on frailty to date in Australia. We have had to depend on international research to predict the prevalence of frailty in Australia. We estimated that in 2011, 270,000 older Australians aged 70 years and older were frail or at risk of frailty. It is possible that by 2050, 4 million older Australians will be frail or at risk of frailty. Of these, 850,000 would be frail. This is comparable to the projection for people living with dementia in 2050, which is about 1 million. Undernutrition is a major contributing factor to the development of frailty. With poor nutrition, there is weight loss, and muscle is disproportionately lost. 
A spiral of decline to frailty occurs if there is no intervention. My research as a PhD student was focused on determining how common undernutrition was in different settings and the impact of undernutrition on health. So in 2002, we were able to report that many older people receiving community services such as domiciliary care essay in South Australia were at risk of undernutrition. 5% of the population were malnourished and almost 40% were at risk of undernutrition. We also demonstrated that those at risk of undernutrition were more likely to be hospitalized and if hospitalized, spend longer in hospital than those who were nourished. We also found that those at risk of undernutrition were more likely to fall over the next 12 months compared to those who were nourished. We then investigated older people admitted to rehabilitation services following an acute illness. The prevalence of undernutrition, not surprisingly, was higher, with malnutrition being present in 30% of the um, hospitalized people and in a risk of malnutrition in 46.1% of patients. Compared to those who were nourished, those at risk of undernutrition were more likely to be readmitted to the acute hospital or be discharged to residential care facilities. These two research papers contributed to changes in clinical pra practice by raising awareness in South Australia. It has also contributed to raise awareness nationally that undernutrition is both common as well as dangerous as it causes poor health. Nutritional risk is more common in settings where there is increased frailty. So if we look at this first column here, what we have is as we move down this table, there is increasing frailty. So if we look at the community, the prevalence of malnutrition is somewhere between 1% to 3%. And if we move down the table, this is residential care with high level of care. And the prevalence quoted here in these studies range from 40 to 71%. There have been studies that have said that risk is almost 100% in some facilities. Undernutrition is associated with many poor health outcomes. Some we have already discussed. It is also associated with increased infections, pressure sores, and post-operative complications. Without intervention, there is a spiral of decline to increase frailty, loss of independence, and loss of quality of life. In talking about nutrition, it is important to understand that the ideal body weight is different for older adults than it is for younger adults. We commonly hear the term body mass index being used. This is weight in kilogram divided by height squared. The World Health Organization has defined that the healthy body mass index range for young adults is somewhere between 18.5 and 25 kilograms per meter squared. An individual is said to be obese if the body mass index is higher than 30. These cutoffs were developed based on the fact that values outside the healthy body mass index range is associated with increased mortality. However, we see a very different relationship between body mass index ranges and mortality in older adults. In this study here, older was defined as age 65 years and older. 32 studies were included in this paper, resulting in 197,940 people being investigated with a five-year follow-up period. So here we see that the increased risk of mortality increases when the body mass index is approximately 22 kilograms per meter squared. So this is very much higher than the 18.5 normally quoted for younger adults. If we look at the upper end, then the increased risk of mortality occurs somewhere when the body mass index is approximately 32.5 kilograms per meter squared. Once again, this is higher than the 25 quoted for younger adults. So in general, we say that for older adults, the healthy body mass index range is somewhere between 22 and 27 kilograms per meter squared. That's very different to what is quoted for younger adults. So except for bodybuilders, perhaps, many people when weighing themselves 
are thinking mainly about fat tissue. But what really makes up weight? Weight is made up of water. Blood alone accounts for 7% of human weight. Water is the largest component and makes up to 60% of weight. It is contained in tissue such as muscle. Bone is very strong, but the total skeleton is only approximately 12% of total body weight. Fat is approximately 20, 25% of weight in women and 18% of weight in men. As if there is obesity, then clearly these percentages are higher. Muscle mass, something that we often don't spend a lot of time thinking about, makes up 30 to 40% of weight of women and 40 to 50% of weight of men. Water is also part of this proportion. So the key take home message here is, although two individuals might actually be of the same height and even weigh the same, they could have totally different body composition. Excess or deficiency in the various tissue result in different health condition. Too much fat results in, in obesity and with that increased risk of diseases such as diabetes, myocardial infarction, stroke, obstructive sleep apnea, and hypertension. Too little bone results in osteoporosis and increased risk of fractures. Reduced muscle results in a disease called sarcopenia, and with that, loss of independence, falls, and fracture, and frailty. Sarcopenia is a Greek word that literally means poverty of flesh. We often hope that when we lose weight, we are losing fat. However, with weight loss, there is also muscle mass loss. This is commonly seen when an older person becomes ill. However, it is difficult to regain muscle even when weight is put back on. Therefore, it is important that weight loss is undertaken for the right reasons, and care is taken to minimize loss of muscle mass. Also, following an acute illness, we must try to ensure that muscle mass is regained. So to summarize, for older people, preserving muscle mass is very important. Weight loss is not necessarily good as muscle is lost. And it is hard to regain this muscle um, once it's lost. The healthy body mass index range for older people is different to that advised for younger people. Weight loss programs for obese older adults must be tailored and monitored to ensure preserved muscle mass and strength. Many factors contribute to poor nutritional health. This mnemonic is very easy to remember, meals on wheels. So contributing factor to poor nutritional health include medications, emotional problems such as depression, things like alcoholism, late life paranoia or psychosis, swallowing disorders, something that's very common if there's been a stroke, oral health, so oral factors, poor fitting dentures, uh, no dentition, poverty, lack of money, wandering and other uh, dementia related behaviors. In fact, with dementia, sometimes weight loss precedes the diagnosis of dementia. Hormonal excess, such as hyperthyroidism, gut problems such as malabsorption or stomach ulcers, eating problems such as inability to prepare food or even feed oneself, restricted diets, especially in institutions such as hospital or residential care facilities, and finally, social isolation. We all know that eating alone, you eat less than when you eat in company. So we are currently supporting research projects to better understand the impact of medications and oral health on nutrition and health outcomes. Through this research, we hope to identify new treatment strategies that could then be further researched to determine if they are effective. So with increasing age, there is a reduction in energy intake. And this is seen with both men and women. With increasing age also, there is a reduction in protein intake. Professor Chapman, who is an endocrinologist at the University of Adelaide, was my PhD supervisor and is a recognized international expert in the field of the anorexia of aging. 
Both of us are investigators with the National Health and Medical Research Council Center of Research Excellence, translating nutritional science to good health, based at the University of Adelaide and led by my other PhD supervisor, Professor Michael Horowitz. So what is the anorexia of aging? With increasing age, there is a loss of appetite. There is a loss in the sense of smell and taste. There is also the loss of feeling of hunger and people feel full easily. There are hormonal and inflammatory factors at play. All of these result in reduced nutritional intake. So we saw that earlier in the graph. So this reduced nutritional intake then results in weight loss. And with weight loss, muscle mass is disproportionately lost. This can lead to sarcopenia. All of this leads to increasing frailty. Muscle mass and strength peaks at the age of 30 to 35 years, and then it's a bit of a downhill slide after that. It, the same pattern is also seen with bone. So it follows that early investment in childhood and youth will help us reach the peak that we should reach. Following that point, investment in lifestyle choices such as nutrition and exercise will help us remain on this line rather than following the course of the lower line. If we are able to stay on the upper line, then we may avoid the development of frailty, and this is one of the methods to achieve healthy aging. So Dr. Solomon Yu, one of my PhD students, and he's here today, is a geriatrician at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and has been completing his PhD part-time. I'm pleased to report that he's expected to be submitting his PhD very soon. As a clinician, his research has been focused on methods to screen and assess for sarcopenia. The diagnosis of sarcopenia can be made when there is a lack of muscle mass as well as muscle performance. Clinically, we feel that the easiest method to measure muscle performance is to assess for gait speed. So how do we assess for gait speed? We mark out 10 meters. We have people start walking and ending it at the 10 meter point. We start the clock at the two, meters, those two meter line and we stop the clock at eight meters. So basically we have timed the person walking six meters, take six, divide by the time and you end up with a meter per second value. If it is less than one meter per second or in some papers less than 0.8 meters per second, then the person is said to have an impaired gait speed. In terms of assessing for muscle mass, this is the way we do it, using a machine called DEXA. The DEXA machine is the same sort of machine that we use to look for osteoporosis. It is commonly available in hospitals. So Dr. Yu, in his PhD, investigated two South Australian longitudinal cohort studies established by researchers at the School of Medicine at the University of Adelaide. So this is the Northwest Adelaide Health Study and the Flory Adelaide Male Aging Study. Dr. Yu was able to propose DEXA cutoffs for low muscle mass through his research. Unfortunately, gait speed was not assessed in the Northwest Adelaide Health Study, and so he used grip strength instead to assess for muscle performance in his research. Dr. Yu found that the prevalence of sarcopenia in men aged 65 years and older was 6.5%, and in women aged 65 years and older, the prevalence was 9.3%. So if we think back to the prevalence of malnutrition in the community that I quoted earlier, which is 1 to 3%, then this is very much higher. These values are very similar to a research published elsewhere from Australia also recently. In people aged 80 years and older, almost one in five men or wo and women are classified as having sarcopenia. So it is quite common. We need to be mindful that these cohort studies excluded people living in residential care facilities. We also know that older people who are frail are less likely to participate in these studies because they are clinic-based and at hospitals. So based on these facts, then the true prevalence of sarcopenia in our community is likely very much higher. Our research group is now planning to undertake further research to determine the impact of sarcopenia on health outcomes.
currently calls by international experts for clinicians to identify sarcopenia early so that there can be interventions to prevent adverse health outcomes. To support the implementation of screening in clinical practice, it is important that there are easy to implement screening methods. They say that a stitch in time saves nine. So this is the basis for screening and acting rather than waiting for a crisis before intervening. So firstly, we developed and validated a simple prediction equation. So I did like maths in school, so this is a mathematical formula. This equation only requires age, gender, weight, and height. So if it's supported by some form of electronic system, then it's really easy to use and most likely can be incorporated in many of the nutritional screening tools that are being used in practice. So well, at least that was our idea. Next, we determined cutoff for low muscle mass using this newly developed prediction equation. We then investigated how best to use this prediction equation as part of a screening tool. We found that in combination with muscle performance, the screening tool incorporating this equation performs well as a rule out screening test. That means those not identified as at risk by this screening tool were unlikely to have the condition. And so we argued that the use of this tool reduced the number of DEXA required at the time of diagnosis, therefore providing some cost savings. Our research group plans now to further investigate the performance of this screening tool in older and frailer population groups, such as those receiving aged care services, a population likely to be at higher risk of having sarcopenia. In many of our clinical care environments, staff are very time poor, and therefore we have been interested in determining if commonly used screening instruments could be used to identify more than one type of health condition. This is especially so if the condition has a common management strategy. So Dr. Dent, who completed her PhD in 2013, investigated if the mini nutritional assessment short form, a commonly used nutritional screening tool, could be also used to screen for frailty. Her research seemed to suggest that there might be some possibility. Similar, similar research has recently also come out of Europe. Once we have confirmed that someone is at risk through screening, we need to next confirm the diagnosis. Once we are fairly certain that someone does have a condition or is at risk of developing the condition, we then usually try to suggest some treatment. Protein is required to build muscle. I was lucky enough to be included in an expert consensus group where we deliberated the current evidence available and then developed some international recommendations with regards to ideal protein intake in older people. Here, our extra special focus were for those frail or in the 80 years and older age bracket. These were the key take home messages. To maintain muscle, older people needed more dietary protein than younger people. The recommendation was for 1 to 1.2 grams per kilogram per day. It was also recommended that 25 to 30 grams of protein is consumed with each of the three main meals. In older people with acute or major chronic disease, then the protein requirements are higher. Ingesting protein after exercise is likely to benefit in terms of building muscle. The group also acknowledged that caution and lower protein levels were required in those with renal disease and not on dialysis. So I've already I've showed everyone the disclaimer, I'm not a dietitian or a nutritionist. So I asked a colleague, Associate Professor Michelle Miller from Flinders University to help me with this slide. Mrs. Aaron Healy, a graduate dietitian, prepared this sample menu for us. This is an example of a menu for a day for a gentleman who is 70 years of age and weighing 75 kilograms with no cardiovascular disease. The person would need 8,300 kilojoules of energy per day and approximately 90 grams of protein. So here we can look at the three main meals and we do meet the 25 to 30 gram protein requirements. And generally, it's recommended that there are snacks in between and attention to water as well. I'm also told by my dietitian colleagues that when 
people are older and frailer, it can be difficult to meet these protein requirements without some form of supplementation. Nutritional supplementation is available in supermarkets and through the chemists. They are not there to replace natural food intake. It may be useful where people are struggling to meet their nutritional needs through their diet. A 240 ml nutritional supplement, for example, just one type, costing approximately four to five dollars per day, may contain 20 grams of protein and 2,000 kilojoules of energy. So for some, that's approximately 25% of their energy requirements. So we will now talk about some strategies to improve strength. Clearly, watching TV all day is not one of that strategy. Vitamin D deficiency is very common in the community. A blood test through the general practitioner will confirm the presence of low vitamin D. Treatment is simple enough. A little bit of sunlight, taking care to avoid skin cancer, and perhaps a nutritional supplement for vitamin D with the doctor's advice. Exercise is very important across the lifespan. It cannot be underemphasized. It is also never too late to start. There are many forms of exercise. Ideally, one should exercise at least 20 minutes per day. There should be a combination of aerobic and resistance exercise through the week. Aerobic exercise are things like walking and swimming, and resistant exercise usually includes weights and bands. And here we see some ladies combining both. Our research group wondered if the use of an anabolic agent such as oral testosterone in addition to nutritional supplementation may improve health outcomes in community dwelling older people at nutritional risk. Our thinking about using an oral anabolic agent was because we were wondering what if someone could not exercise. So oral testosterone in men who are testosterone deficient has been shown to be associated with increased muscle mass and strength. However, it is also associated with many side effects, and so the reason for a trial. In a very small study, so we call it a pilot study, we found that when compared to no treatment, combined treatment with oral testosterone and nutritional supplementation resulted in reduced hospitalization in a group of community-dwelling older people at nutritional risk. However, our research group felt strongly that there was still a possibility that the observed results might have been purely by chance because of the very small sample size. We were then fortunate to secure a National Health and Medical Research Council project grant to undertake a larger study across three states. And we have just completed the 12-month follow-up period and we are currently analyzing the results. Well, it's the silent epidemic striking thousands of older Australians with undernutrition, seeing them lose weight and strength and in turn suffer from falls. Many don't even realise they have a problem, but local researchers seem to have the solution. For 94-year-old Jessie Osterstock, getting older has seen the onset of unwelcome health issues that have landed her in hospital. I did lose weight. Yeah, I had a few falls, but luckily I haven't broken anything. But local researchers may have found a simple solution for the thousands of older Australians putting their health at risk because they're undernourished, many not getting enough protein, leading to a loss of muscle and strength. Around 40% of South Australians who are over the age of 65 and live at home are undernourished and many don't even realise it. It's both a common and a serious problem, particularly falls, fractures as a result, needing to move into nursing homes, it probably doubles the rate of going to hospitalisation. A limited trial at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital has found a daily nutritional high energy drink combined with a testosterone tablet is keeping our senior citizens fighting fit. It seems that this may well reduce their rate of hospitalisation quite substantially. But they now need 200 volunteers for a much larger study. For more information, contact the researchers. Elise Baker, Nine News. OK, so don't contact the researchers because the study recruitment is over. So just as with the pilot research, as well as with other national and international studies, recruiting older people, especially those who are frail, 
uh, to research studies can be very difficult. So despite our media publicity and across three states, we still struggle to recruit uh, enough subjects to the study. So we do need participation in research to ensure that any clinical treatment developed is relevant to the patients or consumers that we intend to treat. So apart from obesity, food intake can also lead to other undesirable health outcomes. Our research group is also interested in research related to postprandial hypotension. Both Professor Karen Jones and Dr. Diana Gentlecore are well known for their research in this area. In older people following a meal, there may be a fall in blood pressure. This fall in blood pressure has been associated with adverse health outcomes such as falls and increased mortality. Dr. Shaila Janair has recently demonstrated that the simple strategy of walking before a meal and intermittently after a meal may help reduce the fall in blood pressure seen after a meal. The red line here demonstrates what happens after a 50 gram glucose drink in people with postprandial hypotension. We can see that the fall in blood pressure is quite significant, reaching almost 20 millimeters of mercury. Now, if the people walked before the drink, and then walked intermittently after, then the fall in blood pressure is not as great. So this is a simple intervention that can be helpful. My first ever publication was a case report in The Lancet. It was a case of a 66-year-old man admitted with symptoms of cognitive decline. He had, he had multiple admissions and multiple investigations at many hospitals for abdominal pain. What was wrong with him? Well, he had a case of lead poisoning. Every year, he made his wine in a bathtub. Unfortunately, the bathtub was, the enamel was corroded. And so the lead from the bathtub would leach into his wine. Luckily for us, no one would share his wine. Only he drank it. So every year, he would finish up the wine just before the next season and we, we looked back and we could see that there was a pattern. He would drink his wine and he would end up in hospital. So we finally treated him and it was reversible. So there are two take home messages here. Take home message one is that we must be absolutely careful how we prepare and store our food. Message number two for the clinicians in the room, Despite the symptoms, when it comes to older people, we must look for reversible factors. And if we treat these reversible factors, then people could possibly get better. I have always been fascinated with technology and curious about the opportunities technology might provide us in helping improve care provision for our patients and consumers. In light of this, our research group has formed a research collaboration with engineers and computer software experts from the University of Adelaide with the hope of developing new technology that might be able to help older people remain independent. Sure, there is always the fear that the technology might be too intrusive or not user-friendly. Science fiction also tells us that we should beware of technology because it might take over the world. So therefore, technology development should be in partnership with consumers and clinicians to ensure usefulness and safety. Dementia is increasingly common in our community. Many more older people are also living alone with dementia. Living at home for as long as possible is a goal that almost all people have. Undernutrition is common in those with dementia this might be because of increased activities such as wandering. It might also be due to the reduced ability to shop for food as well as prepare meals. Sometimes people forget if they have had their meals. Weight loss is therefore common. So we are currently beginning some research to develop and link some smart appliances. This may allow us to monitor nutrition consumption. Possibilities include an alert to family so that they can ring in to prompt or perhaps even call in to check. Where necessary, the information could be relayed to aged care service providers who might also do the same. This is just an idea we have. With research being taken, un taken, being taken elsewhere, then there might be other possibilities.
You'll get it off. He has to be careful. Okay, if everyone's very worried that Asimo is taking a bit long, <laughs> this is Asimo. My name now. is Asimo. Now, Asimo can currently sign in American and Japanese sign language. It's learning new words and phrases all the time. But just imagine how helpful this would be to a hearing impaired person. Of oh, yeah. course, yeah. That be, is that like very difficult for him to learn? It's incredibly complex and it's taken years of research to, to get to this point. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. So how, how, how old is Asimo actually? Uh, mm -hmm. Asimo was first unveiled in 2000. Oh, so wow. 14. So 14, coming up on 14 actually, October. <laughs> I kind of remember Asimo uh, that you're quite a dancer. Is that, <laughs> is that right? Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Have you learned any dance moves uh, like in the last 10 years? <laughs> oh yeah. Uh -oh. Yes. Well, then, you know what, Optima, go ahead, show us what you got. And we'll, we'll see if we can keep up with you. <laughs> so it looks like Asimo is getting faster with age. My name Oops. is... We do not want to see Asimo again. Okay, so at the University of Adelaide, we are keen that our students benefit from the latest research. We incorporate into our teaching programs the latest evidence. This ensures that the new knowledge gained from our research reaches clinical practice for the benefit of our patients and consumers. Traditionally, medical students' teaching has occurred predominantly at hospital campuses. However, we know that consumers spend the majority of their time in the community and outside of institutions. Recognizing this, the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Adelaide has partnered with Rest Haven, a large aged care organization, to establish a teaching and research campus within a residential aged care location. Through this initiative, we have partnered also with many other aged care and community organizations in educational research and clinical activities. The GTRAC mission is to contribute to the healthy aging of older Australians through excellence and innovation in training, research, and clinical services. This is the GTRAC team. So I would like to now conclude this lecture by using this opportunity to launch a short video about the G-Track initiative. G-Track is just incredibly exciting. It's about the new frontier, the new way of providing education in the community, engaging the local providers, the aged care groups, the actual local government, the council, providing a base to show our medicine, nursing and other allied health students what it's really like about giving quality care in the community. Traditionally, aged care has been taught within the acute care hospital setting. However, in recognition that the majority of people over the age of 65 live independently within the community, the Adelaide G-Track Centre is focused on teaching from within this setting and taking a positive and healthy ageing approach. I believe there are a lot of negative stereotypes in the general community about the elderly and ageing in general. And being at G-Track for my rotation, I've really learned to challenge these and i developed a new understanding about healthy ageing and active ageing. What I've enjoyed about working with the students is that because they're working closely with me, I've been able to give them some, I suppose, practical experiences to what actually happens with aged care and also get across to them that we are trying to keep people um, that are living here actively involved, both physically and also socially but the benefit for us is that I'm also learning from them. So it's like a two-way street. I try to encourage other residents to come to the gym with me 
because I think it's very important to keep moving. I've said to many students that a career working with older people is a very exciting pathway. There is many things that young people can learn from older people. I really value talking to the, um, the patients and the clients in the aged care facilities and in the hospitals because it allowed me to hear their stories and their opinions and kind of get their perspective on what they value from their healthcare and what's necessary and important to them. GTRAC provides an opportunity to get research and practice coming together and that means that we'll develop a better outcome for aged care and aged people in our community. Doing my placements at GTRAC over the past year has allowed me to gain a better understanding of the issues around ageing in the community and residential care. Getting to spend time with the consumers at GTRAC has prepared me for the future as well as I realise that whatever pathway I choose in the healthcare industry, I'll be dealing with older people. Geriatrics is certainly an area that interests me now. I felt it was very encouraging to know that these lovely young people are being so well trained here at the GTRAC Centre. I think GTRAC is very worthwhile. I believe that it's very important for our students to communicate with seniors in the community who are living independently and are in good health. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Renuka. Um, I'm Alistair Burt. I'm the Dean of Medicine and uh, Head of the School of Medicine in the University. I'm delighted to thank Renuka on a terrific performance, a marvellous lecture. So 140 years on, a staff of international distinction is still one of the hallmarks of this university. And it's a pleasure to formally acknowledge Renuka's promotion to the professoriate and her leadership in this field of aged care research. Um, we now have some time for questions, and um, I invite you to, to ask those of, of Renuka now. Maybe a um, you might have covered this, I'm not quite sure. But when you're giving frail people protein supplements, in the absence of exercise, is that effective? So, yep, you're correct. It's um, the... Evidence for it being effective on its own is there only for very sick people in hospitals. It's more effective if it is given with exercise and preferably taken after exercise. So are we saying that for elderly people it's uh, probably not such a bad thing to be overweight as defined in, in, in the classical terms? What becomes more important is how much muscle mass they have. So it is better probably to have more muscle mass and so be heavier. Muscle is quite heavy. The other thing that might, we might be seeing is that as people get older, those with um, higher risk of experiencing adverse outcomes from being overweight and obese, their problems would have manifested earlier. So this is something that we call a survivor, survivor effect. So basically those getting into older age, the impact from obesity might actually not be too bad. Um, because they have some sort of protective effect that allowed them to get there in the first place. Then there's always the saying that if you fall, at least if you have a bit of padding, then that's a bit of a natural hip protector. To what extent do you think that the, um, the BMI is misleading because it is just a, uh, a formula of, of height against you know, weight and, and height, and that as we get a bit older, we proportionally we lose muscle, we gain more fat, and that we're not really getting um, the correct measure, which should really be probably lean, lean muscle. You know, we have to look at with some DEXA scanning to see what's ideal. So I think um, you're absolutely correct there. That's the message I was trying to get across. I think this, this, the way we've been taught is to look at weight as being one thing and one thing only, but that's not what weight is. Weight is a mixture of several things, and each of those things have different impact. So for example, lack of uh, muscle can also impact on how we prescribe medications, for example. So perhaps a time has come where we may need to actually measure each of those body compositions rather than just lumping it all into weight and then coming up with a body mass index, which is a formula of weight over height squared. 
just pursuing that a little further, in the younger people, it's recommended that perhaps uh, weight measurement, uh, rather waist measurement is, uh, is important. I suspect it doesn't apply to the elderly. I see rather a bulge in most of the people that I've encountered. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I mean, I think, the, I think what the waist circumference does is it's a way of measuring for a body composition. So it's a way of measuring for central adiposity. So as you get older, the protective effect might be in place. So again, not everyone with central adiposity go on to have side of, uh, the adverse outcomes. So when we measure the central adiposity, some people go on to get cardiovascular risk, um, stroke, and so on and so forth. But some actually don't. They actually are quite healthy even into older age. So I guess the longer you live, then the survivor effect for that becomes more obvious. And then what we are saying is that uh, in geriatrics, we often say the most important thing is whether you can walk. Because um, I think I always tell this joke, like um, I, I do remember an exam question where they said, what is the best predictor of survivor, survivorship? And it was actually, I think, something like, can you get to the fridge? Because if you can't walk to open the fridge and eat food, you can't survive. <coughs> Your BMI figures, are they adjusted for the shrinkage of the bones as people get older as well? Because that will drive the number up as well. Uh, the one from, gen generally it's just weight divided by height squared. So, yes. but, but you are right, every single body composition will change the figures. So which BMI figures? Oh, well, I'm talking about the height one. As you get older, you will naturally get a higher BMI yep. because your bones, uh, because in some people, the bones will cause them to be less high, yep. and that will drive up the uh, weight component of it without doing anything. Yeah, so I mean, if you're referring to the study that I showed, then they didn't do any adjustment for, you know, it's the, the BMI is the adjustment for height, which is the squared. But you're absolutely right, and that's why body mass index, you can't just look at it, because there's actually different components. So there's muscle, there's bone, and there's fat, and I think the time has come to actually measure each one of those components and make decisions based on what your body composition is, rather than saying, you know, the BMI is such. I have a question. I did see a bit of research recently on the correlation of whey protein drinks and um, the possible reduction of dementia. Could you please give some information, if you may have? So that's, Come across that. Thank you. So that's whey protein and whey dementia. Protein yep. And um, whey protein drinks and the possible possibility of reduction in dementia or Alzheimer's. A couple of days ago, I, I, I just saw that research. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I can't absolutely comment on that particular research. So to, from what I know, there is no, uh, like, you can't say that you know, if you take whey protein, you, the, the risk of developing dementia is reduced. And when it comes to dementia, sometimes we will, we will see one article that says something, and then another article that says another thing. So I think when it comes to whey protein, I think that might just be an article, and probably there's a debate still to be held. Um, if I can just comment on that, I also saw an article and it was, I think it went further, it said that um, having the whey protein plus vitamin B12 reduced uh, anemia, the possibility of anemia, and maybe that then um, led into reduced chances of dementia, uh, Alzheimer's. Is that possible? So vitamin B12 deficiency is associated with cognitive impairment, and so perhaps treating the vitamin B12 deficiency can improve cognition. But the relationship is in those people who actually have B12 deficiency. So it's one of the things that we look for when someone has cognitive impairment. It's one of those things we look for to try and look for reversible factors. Okay, well, thank you again, Renuka. Uh, that concludes the formalities for this evening.